before we get into graphics within Super Basic, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to take a browse through the manual just to talk about capabilities of the platform in general. And again, this, this applies to the F256 Junior and the F256K. Um, so to start with, um, the, well, I guess, first a shameless plug, plug for a newsletter that I've been publishing for about a year. Um, and there's a fair number of Junior coverage in there. And of course the K is not released. I haven't done any case specific articles. Um, I might've had a pictorial, I'm not sure actually, I'll have to look back, but just to, um, I'll, I'll put the URL in the description. The point is that there's always a point, right? The point is that there's a number of focused articles and some general information about the junior when it was about to be released. Actually, when it was on a drawing board is where it started. This is in July of 2022. And it carries forward to talk about the Rev B, um, you know, where, where are we? So the kernel, there's an interview in here with Gadget who wrote the kernel. There's discussion about memory management. Uh, there are uh, and a few example programs that I threw together um, having to do with a exercise in, I guess, computing very large prime numbers based on a compute article that was published in 1980, kind of obscure, but it talks about some of the assembly language and some of the add-ons and some of the way that in this um, application, so to speak, I used um, screen memory as memory for the computation. Um, as I have done across the year or so, I make reference to some of the um, history of 8-bit computing. Here I'm featuring the AIM-65, which was another 6502-based uh, system that Rockwell made using Rockwell's license of the chip. Um, and it goes on. We talk about screen, the, the text screen, how to use it, colors, a um, couple of retro flashbacks. Um, so uh, I guess the point here is I will put the URL of, of, the, um, of the marketplace with some specific instructions on how to get to these newsletters. Phoenix Rising is the name of the publication, and I've probably written around 120 pages across the past year um, about Phoenix machines specifically and retro compute in general. So um, that's a quick note on that. Moving on to Peter's manual. Peter Weingartner wrote the manual. It's a, this is the uh, March 4th copy which is a bit aged at this point, we're in June now. Um, so it's been updated. But this is an excellent document. Um, it's actually Peter's second best document that he's written. And I say second best because it's kind of an inside joke. Peter wrote a postscript manual, um, I'm gonna say 20 years ago, I'm guessing, um, that, he, that he kind of brought to my attention. In the first issue of Phoenix Rising, I interviewed Peter. At the time he was writing the MCP kernel which is a kernel that runs on some of the 68,000 systems. And we talked about his background and he, he made reference to his postscript document he wrote. I subsequently did some research on it. It's pretty impressive. This is his second most impressive document, but it is an extremely comprehensive manual um, from probably the best one written. I mean, it is the best one written to date for any of Stephanie's Phoenix platforms. And it goes through some of the hardware, it talks about memory management. Um, it's assembly language focused but it talks specifically about registers and gives examples that are pretty simple. All of these examples are on Peter's uh, GitHub, so you can download them rather than having to type them in. If you're new to assembly language or you'd like to get into assembly language, it's not a bad idea to get your hands on a couple of these, get your environment set up and just try them out and see what you can do to modify them. This uh, program right here is example color matrix. This is in the text section within my, in my book, it's chapter three. This is when I printed it in, in, in March for the VCF show. In this example, you're looking at about 15 lines of assembly code. And what does it do? It puts a letter, puts a character on the screen with a particular background and foreground color, and that's it. So he, it's not a tutorial per se, um, per se but it, it, um, it walks through a number of very simple examples to tell you how to use a particular feature there's tables of all the registers, it's comprehensive, and it's just an excellent document. So let's move on to graphics. Chapter four in mind, maybe different in the, in the, uh, in the current version, um, is, is about graphics. And it starts with a discussion on lookup tables for colors and how to define those. It begins with bitmaps. It begins with a gradient pattern. Um, and by the way, I leveraged this code in one of the first programs I wrote. Um, and I'll talk about that another time. But to begin with, we're talking about pixel data and layers. 
And those are two very important concepts. And the layers are especially important because while the F256 product supports a large number of layers, you can see here there's was seven or eight, I believe. You've got one, two, three bitmap pile layers and one, two, three, four sprite layers. And then the text, which sits on top of all of that. So you've got a whole lot of layers there. Um, I'm mentioning it because this is the platform capability. Super Basic has kind of a trimmed down set of that, such that there's one layer per graphic type. And we'll get into that, but I at least want to mention it because and call it out. Because when I talk about bitmap graphics, which is the first thing that you'll, you'll see following this video, if you're going in order, you'll hear me make reference to the fact that the platform is more capable than Super Basic kind of provides access to. But, the big but, but the registers are accessible most of the registers, just about all the registers in the system are accessible to basic because you have poke and peek commands, because you have the ability to use inline assembly, because you have the ability to load in assembly language that's assembled off platform with a B load command and then execute it with call commands. So that's um, a lot of words and a couple of concepts thrown into uh, a particularly uh, quickly spoken paragraph of information. Um, but uh, I guess the point is there's a lot of material that you can get your hands on to start diving deep, deep, deep into the platform, regardless of the fact that from a super basic perspective, it's very well, uh, I guess, tempered and, and organized um, so that even a beginner can get in there and do some things that are, that are particularly um, satisfying uh, without too much work. And you can take it from there. So let me move along. And, uh, and we talked about layers in general. I'm not going to go deep on that. Bitmaps is one of the assets, the graphic assets, and sprites is a second. Of course, sprites are movable objects. I'll talk about that. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then tiles are the third. So this is tile maps. This is probably the most modern type of graphics that are used in any of the 8-bit systems um, through the years. Of course, tiles didn't exist in the form that they do here in the Commodore 64 days. Um, but they quickly became a thing when Nintendo got onto the scene. And, um, and some of the other systems have used some a rudimentary, um, you know, version of it. But of course here it's tiles, I'll say on steroids, cause it's, it's very full featured. Um, and the maps are, are large and you can have many different maps and sets. So let me go back just a little bit to sprites. Um, cause I'm going to spend a fair amount of time there in the, in the series. Um, I'd like to mention that the set of, of, uh, attributes that have to do with a particular sprite are rather small. In fact, um, there's only, I believe, eight bytes for each sprite that contain metadata information or control information. But this is where you set attributes, either bitwise or bytewise, to tell it that you want a sprite enabled, to tell it what layer you want it in, to tell it what size it should be, eight by eight or 24 by 24 or 16 by 16, to tell it where the memory, uh, where in memory the image exists, because that's an important, you know, one of the most important um, um, aspects of a sprite is where does it exist, to tell it where on the screen it should be, the X location and the Y location, etc. So these, these attributes for a sprite are organized beginning at memory location D900. And this manual tells you in very clear terms uh, how, to, how to manipulate these and what, what each means, what each setting means, etc. Um, and there's an example in here, I haven't tried this example, but he has example displaying a sprite he talks about the visible area, the invisible area, which is beneath the border. Um, and then you have your example with some, some data in byte statements. So if you've been bored for the past 30 years and you really want to go back to the days of typing in byte after byte after, you know, you can, you can satisfy that urge. Tiles I'll talk about just briefly. And we'll have a couple examples and kind of a full-blown application that Ernesto put together for us for VCF East which is a role-playing game demo um, in which you just kind of pilot a, a, a character around the screen on a stationary field of tiles. Um, but, but in essence, there's an analogy that Peter makes at the beginning of it where he says character can be thought of as a tile. It's an analogy between kind of character font and text matrix versus tile, tile set, and tile map. The point is, in the Phoenix, you can, you can define 8 by 8 pixel, or 16 by 16 pixel tiles. You can define a number of tile sets, which are each in, each unique and can have full color by pixel. 
and then you define a map and the map is rather large and the map has a layout of tiles in a map so picture a building block of a piece of land on a map an actual map and the fact that you want to lay these pieces out or well, some may have trees or certain terrain features you want to lay that out on a on a landscape that's larger than the screen now picture the screen or a viewport onto the tile map onto the map and the fact that you can scroll smoothly by pixel by pixel the entire landscape around the viewport. So that's the power of tiles. Of course, it's a finite area, but the idea is that as you move it, you can repopulate portions of the tile map with different tiles. So it's really infinite in, in that regard. Um, it's extremely powerful. I've not spent a lot of time on it. I have spent a lot of time on smooth scrolling on the old Commodore platforms, and that was a burden and a chore and very limited. And here we are in the, uh, I don't know, 90s? Well, not in the 90s. But it's as if we're in the 90s and this machine just came out and it has amazing features that we haven't seen before. So I will stop here. Sound, that's next time. So hopefully that's a quick introduction of graphic capabilities from the platform perspective. There's a number of tables that I urge you to go and have a look at. The chapter name will be different. The chapter number may be different in the actual uh, current live version of the manual. Check the GitHub link um, in the description. Also check the link for the Phoenix Marketplace and the instructions to access the newsletter, which I went through first.